group of girls whose fathers are in prison get a rare opportunity to connect at a daddy-daughter dance. We follow their stories in the documentary, Daughters. I'm Tom Powers, and this is Pure Nonfiction. Daughters made its debut at the Sundance Film Festival and is now streaming on Netflix. The film has two directors, Angela Patton and Natalie Ray Robeson. Angela runs an organization called Girls for a Change. Back in 2007, she helped initiate a daddy-daughter dance in prison. After organizing more, she gave a TED Talk about the experience in 2012. It struck a nerve, and soon she was fielding inquiries from several filmmakers who wanted to work with her. The one who stood out the most was Natalie, who proposed a full collaboration. It would be the first documentary feature for both of them. I spoke to Angela and Natalie in August. They describe how the film is rooted in the experience of the girls. We also talk about the contribution of cinematographer Michael Fernandez, known as Cambio, who brought a personal connection to the subject. And they discuss the support of executive producer Kerry Washington, the actress known for Scandal, who's gotten behind other documentaries. I started by asking Angela to describe her initial work that helped launch the daddy-daughter dance in the first place. I'm the um, founder and CEO um, of Girls for a Change, and I've been doing the work to advance Black girls for 20 years in Richmond, Virginia. And I was um, really facilitating one of our many programs called the Girl Action Team, where we allow girls to really think about issues in their community that they would like to tackle and create solutions. And the girls really were, um, you know, disappointed around the negative narrative and stereotypes around Black fatherhood and how it actually showed up in their personal lives. And their first initial project was to host a dance that would actually be facilitated by them to just celebrate their dads and just be like, you know, we're sorry we don't do our best for Father's Day, you know, but we go all out for Mother's Day. Let's just let you know that we appreciate you. And as the girls were creating this program or event, they discovered that one of their peers' um, fathers or where father was incarcerated and she could not participate in this community dance. And it actually bothered these young girls and they really wanted their friend to have the same experience that they were going to um, be engaged in. So they creatively thought about how could they um, support their peers, girls like them who fathers were incarcerated and wrote a letter to our city sheriff, Sheriff C.T. Woody, and asked for permission to bring a dance of their own inside of our community jail. And the sheriff invited the girls to the jail, had a conversation with them, and was really excited about partnering with the girls. So it was, you know, what led me was just their tenacity and their bravery and how they just really used their voices to create change that they wanted to see on their own terms. And at that point, I understood my assignment and how I needed to show up and support the girls. But a key thing here, I think, that you're trying to emphasize is that it was the leadership was coming from these young girls. Absolutely. Absolutely. So then you did a TED Talk about this experience about uh, 12 years ago that um, got a lot of attention. I wonder if you can describe for me, you know, what it was like to have other people recognizing the, the value of this work. Yes, it was quite overwhelming because I only had two weeks to plan the TED Talk. Someone, um, actually, I know that someone, Courtney Martin, actually um, invited me to do a TED Talk at the last minute. And so I really wasn't, you know, thinking that, you know, something was going to come out of this as big as it did. It was really just to share, you know, this amazing, you know, experience that our girls had the advantage, were able to take advantage of in Richmond, Virginia, a small little town, right? And so when I got off the stage, people immediately approached me with a book idea, film idea, ideas, ideas, ideas. And I'm like, hold up. I just came to just share, you know, these amazing girls and their unstoppable imagination. And um, then when I get home, there are emails like 
I want to help you make a film. Can we make a film? But all of these film, you know, um, directors were really interested in just having access to the jail or prison, talking to the men, really trying to dig deeper into their experiences being in, in, with being incarcerated. And no one really talked about the girls that I mentioned in the TED Talk or even thought about the fact that I'm a girl-centered organization, you know, leader. And Natalie's email resonated with me because she was the only one that really mentioned the girls. You know, she also was really honest about like, this would be my, my first feature doc. I think we can partner, you know, what, can I come meet you? I want to learn more. And it really spoke to my soul. And Natalie came to Richmond, Virginia, really built a relationship with me, the organization, meeting the former sheriff C.T. Woody at the jail when I first did the first dance, as well as past participants. And so I really just appreciated her um, willingness to learn and to and then inviting me to be a co-director to make sure that this story was also protected. So, uh, Natalie, can you talk about where you were in your career when you saw Angela's TED Talk and, and why it moved you so much? I had been doing some work in music videos and short format um, work in Toronto, Canada. And I had been lucky to work with like the United Nations Women and Melinda Gates. And it was really passionate about um, getting young women's stories out into the world. And I'd been able to like work in India and South Africa and the States and Canada. So I, I was really passionate about the work that I was doing. And I felt like I was building some momentum for myself in that space. Um, and when I came across Angela's Ted talk, one of my best friends sent it to me and said, you know, I think this is something that is really going to resonate with you. It was just the most powerful example of what could happen in the world if we listen to young women's ideas. And um, no, hearing that these girls had this idea, listened to that wisdom, were young and connected to this intuition, and then were able to write a letter, have a yes from the sheriff, throw this dance, um, I just kind of couldn't believe how powerful this story was and that, you know, we all could be reminded of the intuition and the potential for change that young, especially young women have. Um, so for me, that was all totally what this um, story and film was about. So I reached out to Angela and then just asked her if she thought about making a film. I also was kind of like, at, at, in terms of your first part of that question at a crossroads of what kind of stories do I want to make? Am I a documentary filmmaker? Am I narrative? And these girls reminded me of my why. And they, it really took me back to who, what were the ideas, those pure ideas I had when I was 12. And it was really like documentaries and social impact films. So not only was it a, a film I wanted to make, but these girls, I think really helped me connect back to the purity of what I wanted to do with my life and work. Um, moving forward. So, uh, Angela, by the time uh, the two of you set out to film one of these programs, you had already been through uh, a dozen or so uh, of these programs before. You knew a little bit um, about, or maybe a lot, about what to uh, expect. And one of the things that comes through in the film is Every step of the way, uh, this is is difficult for everyone. It's difficult for fathers who are incarcerated, who maybe haven't seen their daughters in person uh, for a couple of years. It's difficult for the mothers who uh, you know, can have a lot of complicated feelings of, um, about their partners being uh, in prison, raising a kid on their own. It can be complicated for the uh, the girls um, to be uh, navigating the uh, the loss of a father and the feelings of uh, of their mother. So anyone who thinks uh, uh, this is going to be an easy, happy ending uh, story will find uh, a lot more complications in, uh, in this story. So going into it, knowing that you were going to be facing those complications, what were you setting out to capture and, and and staying true to the sensitivities of everyone involved. Right. Honesty, <laughs> you know, um, I'm aware that it can be unsettling, but I also am aware of the work that I do and the work that I do with Chad as well with family strengthening programs is that we all have to face our heart at some point 
to, you know, get to that place of healing and rebuilding and strengthening our families. And so I wanted to make sure that we did capture that process of just diving in. Um, I've had, you know, many women, specifically Black women, who either saw it at Sundance at a film festival or even the trailer who are saying, thank you for helping me do the hard work and just dive into the healing. I'm, I'm usually avoiding the situation, but I do know that if I face my father wound or my mother wound or, you know, just any relationship wounds that I can actually start to, you know, take the first step. And I feel like the film has allowed me to do that. And so when I hear that, I'm like mission accomplished because I know that we have, you know, unfortunately, these um, old ways of thinking around how to address because of stigma, specifically in the Black community, to sweep our problems under the rug. And one of the things that we also tend to do is not only sweep it under the rug, is like what happens in my house does not go outside of this house. That's a rule, right? And we all know what that means. But I was always hoping that the families see that this could be a healing tool for them, but they also can help pay it forward to other families who have similar experiences and also that look like them. You know, when they see representation of themselves, then they don't doubt that the work is possible and that it is real and that we can accomplish something that could actually not only lead to healing, but it can also lead to relief. It's like you no longer have to bear this and wear this on your shoulders alone. You can find support groups. You can support the girls differently. And you also can now like take a sneak peek in what the father may be dealing with and what he's coping with. Some mothers were like, I never thought about the fact that some of the men shared that, you know, my father did this to me and I'm like doing it too. And they're like, wow, that does make sense to me now. So it allowed everyone to see each other's perspective and then figure out ways that they could collaboratively come together for the daughters. You know, this is the work that you need to do in order to get your daughter to adulthood in a very positive way so that she can see also models of healing and rebuilding and strengthening communities so we can stop this vicious cycle of sweeping it under the rug. Uh, Natalie, Angela said that after she gave her TED Talk, a lot of people were coming to her wanting uh, access to this story and thinking mostly about access to uh, the men in prison, um, uh, who are a significant part of this story. I wonder, as you and Angela proceeded on this, um, you know, what you were thinking about covering uh, men in prison, because it is its own subgenre of uh, documentary film. Um, you know, I wonder if there were things that you felt like, well, you know, we don't want to do that. We'd like to do something else. Yeah, I think um, I was just quite interested to go in and meet all the fathers and um, learn about their daughters through what they had to say. And very quickly, it became apparent just the type, so many rich connections and memories and nuances that they would speak to me about. And it also was a really um, impactful process because I would say, hey, oh, I just, you know, I saw um, Santana and she was, uh, riding the bike and then they'd be like, wait, she knows how to ride a bike. And then suddenly there was this really beautiful back and forth of, um, responsibility and information and connection that the project had between the fathers and the daughters. And then what that also did was made me realize how little they get to see each other and communicate and understand what's going on and how quickly the development's happening. So that was really just filled everything for me. Um, and I was never really interested in um, the layers of telling a, a story about who deserves what. I really believe that children in these girls deserve love. They deserve access to a parent. Um, and that's just how we set forth moving through meeting everybody. Angela, a backdrop to this story is that there's been a, a trend in jails and prisons to cut back on family visits when a prisoner could hug his children or other loved ones. Instead of those in-person visits, they've been replaced by video visits that become a moneymaker for private technology companies. Um, 
can you talk about how that trend has you know impacted the the families that you've come to know? Uh, just a disconnection, you know. I think we actually portray that very well with this simple photography, like that she's just like no longer interested. It's not moving Aubrey. She's, you know, tuning it out. You know, there's other things you can just do on your phone. And it's just a way to just avoid, you know, having to feel de dehumanized. And if the children, if can I say the children can always express that to us, maybe not at that young age, but you can all you can see the mood swing, the shift, the body language, that you know, um, avoidance of just like wanting to participate in such a you know less meaningful. And I think that with COVID, you know, on the bright side of COVID, as we were making this film, it was like we all kind of know what that means, but we could not reach out and touch someone because we were isolated from them, and then they are forced to do it. But then someone gets paid to do this, like really. And so we just wanted to bring that to the forefront that the children become the silent victims of this, the impact the criminal justice system has not only made for people who may not be able to afford lawyers, you know, the, con the, the conditions and the environments that could be in jails and prisons, probation, you know, hearings. It's just always these layers of how the system does not really show up and really make sure that we are rehabilitating people and connecting them and preparing them to not only be back with their families, but also in community when it comes to jobs, education, them being able to vote. So what I believe is it just continues to cause a disconnect for the family and for the father. And so when the father re-enters back into the child's life and he feels like he has to catch up, and the daughter is now trying to catch him up, but frustrated that she has to do so, then we see this vicious cycle once again that continues to disrupt communities, specifically Black and brown communities. I mean, you use the word rehabilitation, which is a word that we sometimes talk about uh, in around incarceration, although nothing in the depiction in your film or any film I've ever seen uh, really suggests that rehabilitation is is any kind of goal um, in in this system. I, I, I mean, can you speak what you've witnessed with your own eyes? Well, the things that I've been able to witness is you know that research that you see at the end, and Sheriff Whitty was kind enough to partner with me with researchers on is this dance that the girls created really a workable tool. Like, is this something that, you know, they created, like all of these other supposedly, like you said, ways of really helping men or women not re-enter and like making sure that the recidivism rates go down? You know, what's really working? And when Sheriff Whitty came back to me and said, I know that when um, men are more connected to their family members that are here in my facility, less likely that they will come back and they not only are better for their families, they are better residents in my facility because they actually start to pay it forward to other men, like participate in the program. Have you wrote your daughter a letter? What are you doing to educate yourself? Are you taking advantage of any of the programs that are inside the, of the facility to make sure that he is ready and capable and are prepared to go back into society so that he will not return. And so that stat came from the fact that Sheriff Woody thought it was important to show that the dance was the answer. The program was the answer. Family is the answer and the solution. So that has been my experience. And I'm glad to be a part of something that is so remarkable and impactful as that. So Natalie, you and Angela were both making your first film uh, in this project. Lots of times uh, when uh, a social issue is at the forefront of, of a film and it's, you're working on a low budget, sometimes making it a cinematic project is it feels secondary. But in your film, Daughters, uh, the cinematography and the cinematic storytelling is quite well developed. Um, and I wonder if you can 
talk about working with your cinematographer and you know what you were doing to you know to to make this film as visually striking as possible the day that we had our um first call with cambio michael fernandez um he put me to tears in a few minutes because he talked about his own story of growing up with a parent that was incarcerated for seven or eight years. And um, he knew what it was like to have to go through metal detectors and a security system and how dehumanizing that felt and scary that felt as a child to visit his parent. Um, so we knew that having someone behind the camera was going to impact who, what was happening in front of the camera and um, making sure that all these spaces were those that were created with respect and openness and non-judgment and a place where the girls could really be themselves and have an interplay with the camera to also like lead where it was going and what we would talk about. So the energy in which, um, we brought to these spaces was like very intentional and Cambio is a big part of developing that. And for him, he also owned that Alexa camera. That was like his baby, his tool. And um, he said that he wanted to photograph these young black girls in the most powerful, rich, cinematic, soulful way that he could. And so he really wanted to um, start with this Alexa camera with um, some, you know, beautiful prime lenses um, and bring that tool in, but also let the girls kind of inform us what their um, visual world would be. So um, that's how we sort of set off at the beginning. But Cambio just has a really artistic eye. I can't say that anything um, was really this high crafted thought through kind of overly produced. It's really about the magic of, I think his eye and using natural light. So, um, pretty much nothing was planned in terms of locations and times of day and all these other things that people really think about when they want to make something like a visual film. We were kind of pinching ourselves the first two months going like, I can't believe the sky is happening. Now there's this thunder behind Santana. Now we're at this location. It was all places that the families brought us to go. And um, it did come out incredibly cinematic and, and beautiful. But that's just sort of the world also that that we were in. And then through the dance, shooting that on film, I think that that was, um, that was just one of the creative choices with no, you know, you can't control anything and wanting to really respect the distance from the families going through that dance and not talk to anyone the whole day. Shooting on film allowed us to, um, you know, create an image that was as human and timeless as possible. And um, I'm glad that we did that. And then post-dance, a lot of it I filmed um, on my own, but because I'd worked with Cambio so much and we developed a language for the types of framing and movement that we would um, embody with the girls, then I was able to sort of like carry on the visual style that he um, developed at the beginning. Angela, for you, this is a world you've been living in, working in. You, you, you know, are a figure inside this film. What was it like to become a storyteller uh, of this world? When, when you're telling stories, you have to shrink things. You have to make uh, choices about what to leave in, what to leave uh, out. What was that like for you? Similar and different because I believe that I've been telling a story for a while about, you know, the um, contributions that Black girls have, that I've experienced, I guess in the world, the contributions they make to the world. And so I've been doing that because I am an activist, you know what I'm saying? So I'm always like speaking up for them. And um, I also am an author of a book and I have a TED talk. So I've been telling a story for a while, but what has happened with this is that I found the power of the tool of telling a story through, you know, film. And I was able to discover that it's so much more, even with the trimming and the pacing and the, what we have to leave out and some of the things that Natalie and I discussed about, wow, we wish we could have put that in, but that would last four more hours. And really grateful. And I found that it is an honor to have been able to discover a new way to tell a story, right? Where I can um, have more eyeballs on something that I've probably been raising hell about 
for a long time through other mediums. Still love those two, but the power of them has actually now um, made me kind of open my mind around how I can continue to make sure Black stories are protected and told in ways where they have integrity and they have truth. And then they also have change that we want to see make um, just a big difference in the world with really truly me leading and guiding to elevate the voices that are usually unho un unheard from Black girls. Natalie, uh, this film has a great supporter in uh, Kerry Washington, um, who I know from her past work on the documentary The Fight about the ACLU, that she's a person who picks projects very deliberately and uh, and really puts her heart into them. Um, I wonder if you can talk about you know what it's meant to to have Kerry Washington as a supporter and part of this project. Yeah, she's incredible. Um, I think that anyone who's come into this project in the last eight years has come in for a reason. There's been so much synchronicity, like I explained Cambio, our editors, um, then kind of hearing about Carrie's work and thinking about ways of, you know, partnering to do our impact campaign. Um, there was people on our, our executive producer team that knew her and were kind of like, oh my God, you guys are sing saying the same thing. You guys all need to meet. Um, and so it's been amazing having her, um, you know, work with us and develop the impact campaign that's going to be launching now and, you know, last for the next few years. And, um, you know, a woman that is, that is working in the narrative space, a storyteller doing impact, the documentary world, it's actually hard to have success in all of those. And a lot of projects try, but I think that where we're so unique is like me and Angela, telling the story together and having girls for change is already having this 20 year work in that community and Chad. And, um, now with Carrie's involvement, I really think we can do something massive with this. And I'm excited to see what, what, what happens after it's released. So Angela, you've spent more than a decade, well, more than a decade seeing up close, the world of America's incarceration program, what do you hope that uh, that other people who haven't had that same eyewitness experience will, will take away from this film? Yeah, for those who will be new to um, understanding the harms that the criminal justice system has done for our families, the girls, the mothers and fathers, um, I am hoping that it would be an eye opener so that they could think about locally what they probably can do in their own backyard to create change and really, you know, you know, think about, oh, it's, you know, how am I voting for my sheriff and warden? Who's actually creating these, you know, policies that are disconnecting um, families and causing harms on children's, you know, mental health and, you know, isolating them? Like, what can I do? And hopefully that they will research policy um, initiatives like a prison reform you know, organization that are already working toward that goal because each state does have people and organizations that are championing away trying to create this change and either hitch themselves to support them or start something new if it's nothing in your backyard and you don't see anything that you feel like resonates with you, staying in the gaps that you may experience. And those of us who are already doing this activism work within our communities, just keep championing along and use the film as a tool because I know as a community leader, sometimes you do feel alone and no one hears you and they don't see you and they're not supporting you and you're fighting for funding and you're fighting for your board to show up, for all the things that go with running a nonprofit. Use the film as a tool, host a watch party, you know, have a discussion, you know, make sure that you all create you know, the impact in your own backyard, again, within your nonprofit organizations. It's because there are sometimes people that are out there doing this work, but they just need some type of support. And I believe that the film can really support organizations that feel isolated and alone. But I just wanted you to know that we hear you and we see you. And hopefully we created a tool for you to like really leverage your work.
to thank Angela Patton and Natalie Ray Robeson for speaking with me. Their documentary, Daughters, is streaming on Netflix. We have a newsletter called Doc Voices, now overseen by Bella Racklin. You can find it by searching on Substack for pure nonfiction. If you want to advertise to our 40,000 readers, send an email to listen at purenonfiction.net. Thanks to our team, series producer Hannah Nordenswan and web designer Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Raphael Anehausen. I'm Tom Powers. Follow us on Instagram and visit our website at purenonfiction.net. Thank you.